Chandler. Good morning. I'm glad the acoustics in here are good enough to overcome the fact that uh, I've got to turn my microphone on. There we go. Probably hear me a lot better now. As always, it is a joy to see you here at Chandler Reformed Church. And a few announcements before we begin. If you notice in your bulletin uh, that we have some address changes for Nell, Marv, and Dorothy, they are all in the nursing home side of Edgewood currently. Additionally, uh, Jen is in the ER with a blood clot. Thankfully, her daughter was there to catch it in time and was able to get Jen to the hospital. But it is still a very sensitive time for Jen, so please continue to pray for her. A few announcements that I definitely want to point out is that we are taking pictures for our directory. Please contact uh, Meet Up with Faye or Joyce after church so that they can get your pictures taken. And as we know, our custodians are about to retire. We are very thankful for their many years of service. And well, with that goodbye, there's also a low as we welcome uh, the wreath. The Reedsma family will be coming to take over custodian duties from the Vives. Anyway, to honor that, on October 31st, after church, there will be a dinner for us to say thank you for the Oi Patsy, as well as to say hello to Mike and his family as they come and well, keep our church looking clean and beautiful. And we also are celebrating with the bakers as they celebrate their anniversary. I'm not entirely sure how many years they have. Uh, Loretta didn't tell me, but <laughs> I am sure it is, has gone by in a flash of wonderful, joyous years. To celebrate that, at the end of our worship service today, um, we'll be playing a song that they had on their wedding day. So please join together in celebrating their anniversary. With that, brothers and sisters, May the love of the Father, and the grace of the Son, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Will you please join me in worshiping our Lord by singing number 68, We Praise Thee, O God, our Redeemer. Will you please rise. <laughs> singing sanctuary.
Brothers and sisters, the peace of Christ be with you all. As God has welcomed you here today, please turn to your neighbor and welcome them. Please join me in a responsive reading of Psalm 37, found in your bulletins. People of God, do not fret because of those who are evil, or be envious of those who do wrong. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in Him, and He will do this. He will make your righteousness shine like the dawn, your vindication like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for Him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret. For those who are evil will be destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. Wait for the Lord and keep his way. He will exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are destroyed, you will see it. I have seen a wicked and ruthless man flourishing like the luxuriant native tree. <laughs> Consider the blameless. Observe the upright. A future awaits those who seek peace. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in times of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge. The Lord is our refuge. He is our peace. And yet when times are evil and trouble surrounds us, it is easy for our anxieties to distract us from the loving presence of our God. It's easy for us to fall into temptation and seek after our own kingdom on our own terms and turn away and break the commands that God has given us. But our God is a loving God who always welcomes us back. He seeks us as the good shepherd. So let us join together. Let us go before our Lord to seek his forgiveness. We join him in prayer. Holy God, our Lord and Savior, you are the giver of life and the God of love. You made each person in your image, and you tell us in your word to love each other as you have loved us. Holy God, we confess that we have not loved you with all of our heart, and we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We confess that instead of loving our neighbors, we choose to love ourselves and those who are easy to love. We confess that we love the works of our own hands. Forgive us when we turn away from you and turn from others. Forgive us when we, when we are weak and foolish. Forgive us when we love our own more than we love your own. Forgive us when we cling to our rights more than we cling to you. Teach us, Lord, Though we are weak, you are strong. Fill us with your love and compassion for all people, so we have eyes to see those around us who are in need of your faith. Give us hands and feet willing to reach out. Stir us to invite others to use their gifts for your glory. As you have loved us, help us to love others. Have mercy on us, O God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Children of God, 
God has made his ways known to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquity. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on a child, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how he formed us. He remembers that we are dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone, and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him, and his righteousness with their, with their children's children, with those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts. And all God's children say, Amen. Amen. As a hymn of thanks and praise, let us join together in singing 657, Cleanse Me, verses 1, 2, and 3. Our scripture reading today is Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Before we begin reading, I just want to remind us of our journey that we've been on so far through this book of Ecclesiastes. At the beginning, Solomon declares that life is hevel. Now this is a difficult word to translate from Hebrew into English. Most English translations will say that life is meaningless or is vanity. Others will call it vapor or fleeting. One other translation calls it smoke. I prefer to use the term cloud. Solomon is saying that life is like a cloud. What does that mean? Well, clouds are relatively simple things. They're just water vapor floating in the air. But even though clouds are empty, we can't see through them. We see them, but their shape is always shifting. It's hard for us to describe what a cloud looks like. We can feel the cloud, but we can't hold on to it. Clouds come and clouds go. They are blown by the wind. Similarly, what makes a cloud good is also what makes it bad. We might say that a cloud is good because it provides rain, except in a season of flooding. We may say that a cloud is bad because it blots out the sun, makes everything dark and gloomy. 
except in the summertime when the cloud provides us relief from the hot scorching rays of the sun. It's hard for us to make any definitive statements out about the cloud. So it is with life. And through Ecclesiastes, Solomon has been warning us against a simple view of life, and more importantly, having a simple understanding of God. Our lives are more complicated than a cloud, and God is much bigger and grander than our own lives. And so as we read chapter 9 today, when we come to the places where in our few Bibles it calls life meaningless, I will instead translate that as our cloudy lives, our lives that are difficult to understand, that we have a difficult time understanding the good and the evil in our own lives. And so with that, brothers and sisters, will you join me in praying for wisdom from the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, I pray that you will fill our hearts with wisdom and knowledge. Illumine our reading today so that we can grow closer to God and grow our love for Jesus Christ. May we continue to learn just how broad and how high and how deep is your love for us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. So I reflected on all this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no man knows whether love or hate awaits him. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good man, so it is with the sinner. As it is with those who take oaths, so with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil, and there is madness in their hearts while they live, and afterward they join the dead. Anyone who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, and even the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate, and their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. So go, eat your food with gladness, and drink your wine with a joyful heart, for it is now that God favors you. Always be clothed in white, and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of your clouded life that God has given you under the sun, all your cloudy days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave, whether you are going, there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift, or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the learned. But time and chance happens to them all. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come. As fish are caught in a cruel net, or birds are taken in a snare, so men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. I also saw under the sun this example of wisdom that greatly impressed me. There was once a small city with only a few people in it, and a powerful king came against it, surrounded it, and built huge siege works against it. Now there lived in that city a man poor, but wise, and he saved the city by his wisdom. But nobody remembered that poor man. So I said, Wisdom is better than strength, but the poor man's wisdom is despised, and its words are no longer heeded. The quiet words of the wise are more to be heeded than the shouts of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Up here, we have a picture of a whole lot of rust. This is the USS Sockham. Doesn't appear to be anything special. I'm sure there are hundreds, if not thousands, of riverboats rusting away in rivers across our country. But the Sockham is not a riverboat. She was designed for the open ocean. So what is she doing in a small river in the backwoods of Kentucky, 500 miles from the Atlantic Ocean? Well, 
Her keel was laid down in 1901, and she was intended to be the most, most luxurious yacht that could be built at the beginning of the 20th century. She had the finest steel, the finest steam engine. She was filled with luxuries like mahogany wood paneling. When construction was completed on her, she was a marvel to be found in the New York City Harbor. But she didn't stay a luxury yacht for long. When the United States entered World War I, she was appropriated into the United States Navy. And even though they put armor plates and a machine gun on her deck, well, obviously she wasn't going to survive a fight with an actual warship. But her speed and agility made her perfect for hunting submarines. In fact, Thomas Edison had a lab on board where he developed new techniques for finding enemy subs. And then World War I ended and she returned to civilian use. Except now, after her military upgrades, she's not quite as luxurious as she was before. And time has gone by. In the 1920s, better ships could be built than in 1901. And so even though she's still a yacht, she's not quite as luxurious and top of the line as she once was. And then when World War II starts, she again is appropriated into the Navy. Once again, she's looking for German U-boats. But this time, she's a training vessel off the coast of Florida and patrolling the waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Honorable service, but a trend has formed. She's not as luxurious as she once was. She's not as useful as she once was. And then, following World War II, she becomes a deep-sea fishing boat, taking tourists out into the Atlantic to fish for tuna, marlin, or whatever it is they're looking for. And then in the 1970s, she becomes a tour boat, and her life has come full circle. She once was a marvel of the New York City Harbor, but now she's a tour boat going around that same harbor, showing tourists the marvels of the city. And then in the 1980s, after she briefly appears in the Madonna music video, a private collector buys the USS Sodom, intending to take her home and restore her to her former glory. Turns out that home is in the backwoods of Kentucky, not far from Cincinnati. And so she begins her final voyage from New York City through a series of rivers into the backwoods of Kentucky. Unfortunately, the owner dies before the work could be complete. The ship becomes part of the property, but none of the subsequent owners have the money or the inclination to restore her to how she once was. And so, after 30 years of storms, floods, and neglect, the once luxury yacht, USS Sockham, rusts away in a small moor in the backwoods of Kentucky. So what can we learn from life from the USS Sockham? Well, to answer that question, let us take another look at Ecclesiastes chapter 9. At the beginning of chapter 9, Solomon once again makes an observation that we are all going to die. All share a common destiny. The righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. He presents us five, five opposites to show us that everyone dies. And he definitely piles it on over and over again. Everyone goes the same, to the same place. Now what's important to note about this series of opposites is that they all have religious significance. It's not just that the rich and the poor all go to the same place, but it's those who make sacrifices and those who do not. Those who practice religion and those who do not practice religion, it doesn't matter, we're all going to die. In the context of everything we've read so far, Solomon is warning against having a small religion, especially a small view of God. If you're going to the temple to offer sacrifices, if you're coming into a church in order to sing hymns and pray, thinking that you are somehow earning favor from God, as if you could compel God to bless you and give you long life, well, Solomon has bad news for you. There is no guarantee in life. The righteous die just as the sinners do. Those who go to church die just as, just as certainly as those who do not. And as Solomon noted earlier, there are times when the righteous person gets a wicked person's reward. 
In fact, often Solomon has noted that it is the wicked and the fools who enjoy a long life and wealth in this world. This is an evil thing that Solomon sees, and he finds its root cause to be that the hearts of men are full of evil and madness. Now, for those who are experts on the Torah, as Solomon certainly is, and anyone studying Cleveland should be, the phrase, hearts full of evil, should ring a bell in the back of our head. Back in Genesis, when we read about Noah and the flood, once Noah and his family get out of the, out of the ark, well, they start stumbling and falling again. Noah gets drunk, passes out naked, his sons have a scandal because of it. God looks at what this family is doing, and he declares that the hearts of our men are full of all kinds of evil. And in response to that judgment, God makes a promise, an oath, a covenant. God promises that never again will he send a flood to destroy life on earth. In fact, as long as the earth and heavens endure, the seasons will continue as they always have. Summer and winter, sea time and harvest, the cycle of life will continue, and God will not break that, even though humans are sinful and always make mistakes. This is the hope that the living have in verse 4. Now, if we believe that life is meaningless, then this hope would kind of be a, a bitter hope, ironic hope. What hope does the living have? Well, if life is meaningless, then that's not a real hope. We all know that we're going to die. Our really, the only hope that that person would have is that, well, at least today I can enjoy something, whereas those who are dead can't enjoy anything. But if our hope is in the Lord, if we're putting our hope not in our religious practices, but if we're putting hope in what God has done for us, then we have hope that's not just strong for us today, but endures for us tomorrow. In verse 5, Solomon again writes us a little poem about how the living know that we're going to die and that we have no further reward once we're dead. For the dead, all their love and their hate, their jealousy, all the things they hope for in life have vanished away. Never again will have anything to do with what happens on earth. Now, this sounds awfully depressing, and yet, in the context of work and receiving a reward, there is a lot of grace in this little poem. For the living know that while we are on earth, we have work to do, and Solomon has often called this work wearisome and toilsome. If our hope is in the Lord, then in death we have rest. We stop working. Now, if in life we're not enjoying God's presence, if in life we're seeking our own rewards, then we're going to have trouble in death. Because the person who doesn't enjoy God's presence in life is probably not going to enjoy God's presence in death. This is why we the living have hope. For while we are alive, we still know that God is God. And we can cling to the love that he has given us. And because we cling to the love that God has given us, we are able to follow Solomon's advice of enjoying the food that we eat enjoying the wine that we drink. More importantly, we can enjoy the pleasures that God has given us, of which there is none better than a wife. Now, of course, Solomon is speaking to other men, but I think being a husband is just as good as being a wife as well. So ladies, enjoy your husbands as thoroughly as husbands enjoy your wife. But we shouldn't be too quick to judge. By that I mean, in life is a cloud. Things that appear good aren't always good. For example, there are people who dedicate their life to the Lord, and they live, and they never get married throughout their entire life. This is neither good nor evil, but it is an opportunity for us to praise God. For those who have been married for 50, 60, maybe even longer, this is a great joy. But we should be too quick to judge. It's not the long marriage in and of itself isn't a good thing or a bad thing, but it is an opportunity for us to praise the Lord. And of course, there are widows and widowers who have buried their spouses. 
Don't be too quick to judge. Rather, use this as an opportunity to praise the Lord. For our days in life are clouded. It's hard for us to know what is truly good and what is truly bad. It is easy for us to judge that a long marriage is better than a short one. But a long marriage without God is much worse than a short marriage that is blessed by his hands. And so, enjoy your spouses. Give thanks to God every day that you have with them. And when the time comes, we are able to hold on and let go. For clouds come and clouds go. God gives us blessings and God takes them away. This might be a time, a cause for sadness and despair, but our hope is in the Lord. We know that God has given to us today, and we know that God is going to take that away from us at the end of the day. But we let God take our blessings away because we know that He is a giving God who abounds in love. Just as God has given to us blessings for today, we know that God will continue to give us blessings for tomorrow. And so we do not need to be filled with fear and despair. We don't need to cling on to our life. We can hold on to it with open hands. For sometimes the only way that God can give us more things is to take away the old blessings that he gave us yesterday in order to bless us with renewal for tomorrow. And even though we know that these gifts will pass away, our work, our knowledge, our wisdom, everything we desire in life, all of this is passing away. And yet we should remember the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians. As he talks about the many spiritual gifts out there, he says all of these gifts, including our knowledge, will pass away. But what remains? What remains is faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love is the hope that we have while we are among the living. And now we come to my favorite verse in the book of Ecclesiastes, and maybe my favorite verse in the entire Bible, verse 11. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor riches to men of understanding, nor favor to men of skill. The time and chance happeneth to them all. I believe that USS Sockham is a perfect example of time and chance happening to everyone. She was intended to be a luxury yacht, became a ship of war, a fishing boat, a tour boat. She became a private collector's joy only to slip into ruin when that collector passed away. When she was first constructed, nobody could imagine the history that she would have, the highs and lows, the honor and the, well, being forgotten. It is easy to think, well then what's the point? What's the point of doing anything if it's just time and chance? Might as well just sit on your hands and be lazy if, if all we have to do is roll the dice to see what happens, if work doesn't do any good. But that is the wrong lesson to take from Solomon. Because we don't know what's going to happen next. No bird intentionally flies into a snare, and no fish intentionally swims into a net. And just as they don't want to be caught, so we want to continue our lives. But the most sure way of coming to our, a life to, rather, the most sure way to end our lives too early is to sit around and do nothing. A bird that doesn't fly is easily caught, and the fish that just sits there is easily snared. Even though we know that our lives are coming to an end, a life that isn't devoted to doing the work of God, a life that isn't focused on enjoying the pleasures that God has given us, would be a very empty life indeed, no matter how long or how short it is. And Solomon concludes this chapter by, see, by relating a story of something that touched him quite deeply. He saw a poor man save a small city from a mighty army. And yet this poor man was soon forgotten, and the city did not listen to his words. Again, we might ask, what's the point? What's the point in saving the city if the people are just gonna ignore the old man afterwards? 
The point is that we don't know what is truly good and truly bad. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Again, think of the yacht. If the designer and builder of this yacht knew what her history was going to be, maybe they would have changed the design, changed the materials that they used. Then she wouldn't have been what she actually was. Or worse, they might have despaired and decided to give up. If they wanted to build a yacht that would last forever, and they knew that eventually she was just going to turn into rust, despair might have set into the hearts and they would never have done the work at all. And that would truly be an evil thing. And yet we don't put our hope in a life of eternity, or rather, an eternity of living under the sun. If that was our goal, we're going to fail, and we're going to be very disappointed. On one hand, we shouldn't think too much about the future, about the fact that we're going to die, because we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. On the other hand, we should make choices knowing that we're not going to live forever, and that is a great blessing and grace. For we know that our hearts are full of evil and madness, and we're going to make mistakes. We're going to hurt people and break things, and yet we know that our sin isn't going to last forever. Even our iniquities are going to be taken away, like a cloud being blown by the wind. They will be separated as far as the east is from the west. So I'm glad that even though, I'm glad for the USS Sotham and the, and the example that she has set for us. For if she could talk, I wonder what she would say. Now, in human terms, you might say that a luxury yacht is more important and better than a, an old tour boat going around New York City. But if she could talk, I wonder if she would say that being the luxury yacht, that was boring and lonely, as most of them just sit around in the harbor waiting for their masters to come to go on a joyride. But as a tour boat, every day she enjoyed the presence of hundreds of people. She was able to bring a bit of joy and knowledge into their lives. Perhaps if she could talk, she would say that being a lowly tour boat was much better, more enjoyable than the luxury yacht. Life is confusing and you can't always tell the difference between the good and the bad, which is why we obey God's commands. For God can tell the difference between good and bad, and God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. And when we obey God's commands, command to love God and to love our neighbor, to do the work that God has given us, and to enjoy the food and family that is around us, then we can have rest and peace. Even though we are surrounded by the shouts of the rulers of fools, and as a side, I think we are definitely living in a time where rulers of fools are shouting quite loud. Yet with the wisdom that comes from the fear of God, the wisdom that comes from loving Him and keeping His commands, we are able to overcome mighty nations and armies, not by the strength of our arms or by the power of our words, but rather by the power of the Word of God and the love of Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. Amen. As a hymn of response, will you please join me in singing number 676, O Jesus, I Have Promised.
At this time, I invite our deacons to come forward and lead us in the giving of our offering. We come to church every day, bearing many burdens on our hearts and on our minds. And it is a joy and a pleasure that we can come before a God who accepts these gifts, all of our burdens and broken hearts, as pleasing worship to Him. So let us join together in bringing it in prayer to Jesus. Holy Father, Holy Son, and Holy Ghost, I thank you, Lord, that you have called us your own, that you have made us and given us life. You have given us life on this green earth that you have made, and you give us life in your heavenly kingdom. I thank you, Lord, for that beautiful blessing. So, Lord, we come before you with gratitude and humility, asking that you will continue to bless us, protect us, and strengthen us. Lord, we particularly pray for Jen right now, and she's in the hospital with a blood clot. I'm thankful, Lord, that there are doctors and nurses who can care for her, Lord, we know that nothing we do can be successful if 
you are not there helping us. So we pray that your hands will give strength to the doctors and nurses, and that your healing spirit will rest upon Jen. Restore her to health. May she be back on her feet soon, so that our family of believers here can be complete once more. In the meantime, Lord, I pray that you'll be with her daughter, Glenda, and her family, who is very worried about Jen. May your spirit give them comfort and courage and endurance to faithfully walk. Lord, we also pray for our brothers and sisters who can't be with us here. We pray for Hedy and Hospice. We are thankful that Marvin is back in Edgebrook, and we continue to pray that you will strengthen his legs and give him health. We pray for all of our brothers and sisters who are at home right now, that even though they are not here with us in body, we know that by the power of your Spirit, we're united in Christ. Lord, we pray for our children and grandchildren and all of our family that is across this country and our world. Lord, this world belongs to you, so we lift them up to you putting our hope in the good works of your hands. We pray for those who are traveling both near and far. We pray for those who work at home, who work in offices. We pray for the farmers that are continuing to harvest their crop. We pray for those who are taking care of their livestock. We pray for the men and women who dedicate their lives to helping others, whether it's in the military, as police officers, as firefighters, teachers, the list is endless, Lord. Bless them all, we pray. Lord, we thank you for this country that we live in, for our rights and our freedoms. We pray, Lord, that your spirit of wisdom will be on our president and our governors, be with our legislators and our, and our judges in the courts. Lord, we look at the news and so often just want to get mad and frustrated. We hear so much shouting from foolish leaders, and so, Lord, we turn to you for help, and we put our hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, you are the Prince of Peace. We pray that you will come and establish your reign on earth. But in, that, in the meantime, Lord, I pray that you will take our worries and our fears and anxieties and replace it with your faith, hope, and love, so that we, by being more than conquerors, can overcome the shadows and darkness that have, seems to be in every corner of this world. May we share the good news of Jesus Christ. May we be your agents, renewing this world wherever we are. And so, Lord, we thank you for missionaries who are willing to go to every single corner, whether it's our own country or around this world. Thank you for these missionaries that carry your word out to the people of this world. We thank you for the Bruxfords and the Hubers and the Dwarves Silvas, and we pray that you will bless their work. Strengthen their hands and their feet so that no matter what challenges surround them, they will be more than conquerors, resting in the presence of your Holy Spirit. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll also be with us in our walk this week. Strengthen our steps, give us the skill to do our work, and give us, Lord, the joy of your presence so that when we eat and drink and enjoy the company of our family, we always know that you are there with us, not because of anything that we have done, but because of your grace. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray, amen. Oh, she is home. Okay. So, uh, apparently Jen is no longer in the hospital, for that we can be thankful, but she is still in tender care, so please continue to pray. Let us conclude our time of worship by rising and singing our dexology. We please rise in body and spirit.
Brothers and sisters, put your hope in the Lord. Go out, do your work. Whatever it is that your hands wants to do, do it and enjoy the grace that God has given you. Enjoy life with your family, your friends, and your neighbors, knowing that God's promises are above you. So that whatever you do, do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us conclude our time of worship by joining together in singing number 727, Faith is the Victory. Brothers and sisters, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn to you and give you peace.